Well, ladies and gentlemen, I enjoy watching y'all fellowship with each other. That, that psalm is true. 133rd Psalm, it's good and pleasant when brethren dwell together in unity. It's like the precious ointment that ran down the beard, even Aaron's beard, and ran down the skirts of his garments. It's like the dew of the morning. He said it, he said it's there that the Lord commanded the blessing. Have you ever wondered why your life lacks a certain blessing? If there's ever a lack, it's always, spiritual things are always strange if you don't understand what the Word says. But once you understand what God's Word says, spiritual things make sense. People that lack blessing in their life need to re-examine going back and dwelling with people around them in unity. If you can't get in unity with someone, and you can't walk together, then separate. Go to the people that you can be in unity with. And once you're in unity with people, there'll be a blessing that comes on you that'll affect your finances, it'll affect your life. You love people you can't get along with, but don't go get in the mix. Don't get caught up in the, in the banter. Don't get caught up in the, in the hydraulic of continued ongoing strife. The angels of prosperity back away from that and they won't associate with you. Amen. Up here, you'll notice um, I have a display here just under the pulpit. And I have a, a, a large bouquet. How many, how many roses do we have? Three dozen. Three dozen roses. These roses serve two purposes today. One is I want every one of my young mothers to all have roses today. Oh, they're young too. You're still in the earth, ain't you? You're young. Also, these, uh, I displayed these today and wanted to display these because, uh, of, because it fell today. Uh, my dad, Bert Floyd Alexander, will be having his 100th birthday tomorrow in heaven. <clears throat> and this is a picture of him and his, uh, he was born in Toomsboro, Georgia, Wilkes County, Georgia, May 13th, 1919. He uh, went on to, uh, he was the youngest of uh, three boys and had two younger sisters, seven in all, uh, six in all, six in all, seven, seven in all. And uh, uh, he uh, tells me, told me a story of in, in 1925, he was six years old and his, uh, the uh, finances, uh, just a bit, not, it wasn't finance, they didn't call it finances back then. Being able to live had gotten so hard in South Georgia that his dad loaded up a, a mule-drawn wagon, loaded up him, himself, his uh, oldest brother Bill, who was 10 years older, so he was 16, and his brother Jack, who was um, at the time um, about 11 years old, and my dad, six years old, and put him in that wagon pulled by an old mule by the name of Cora. He said they pulled out onto the gravel uh, washboard road and struggled to get up to the main highway. And they finally got to what was the main highway then. It was a state highway that went north and south. And he said and for three days he heard Cora clop, 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 clop. He said they rode all day. He said just as dark would start to come on, as they call it, evening. He said Papa would pull the wagon over and make camp, build a fire, put a cover up over the open top uh, cart, wagon that they had. And uh, he said I'd go to sleep after we'd, Papa would feed us. We're going, Papa. I'll tell you when we get there, boy. And he said the next morning, they'd, he'd be cold and dew would be on him. And he said that um, Papa would pull out, clop, 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 clop. Went like that for three days. About three o'clock on the third day in the afternoon, he said he was so tired, he said he remembered waking up and they were coming up close to a city line. He said, Papa pulled over one more day. Next morning, he said he woke up, he was, they were on Whitehall Street downtown Atlanta. 
And he said, I had never seen anything like it. He said, I looked around and saw all the buildings. And he said, old T models were driving by. And he said, Papa would hold on to Cora and she'd get spooked. He said, he was trying to hold her, stop her from getting too spooked. He said, and then one of those uh, train car, tra trolley cars went by ringing a bell and Cora bolted. And he said, it was like something in a Wild West show. He was trying to hold her up. He said, finally, he had to jump out there on her and grab her by the head and pull her head down between her front legs, hollering, yeah, 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 trying to get her to stop. Finally got her to stop. He said, all but turned over the, ca the cart. He said, uh, and they found a place down here off of Sandtown Road in Atlanta and made camp. He said, my papa was a hustler, he said. He was determined to make a living. He began to work in a shop where he turned table legs. When he began to make some money, he called for the girls and called, got Bessie, his wife, my Aunt Elizabeth, my Aunt Hazel, and my Aunt Bessie, and got them to Atlanta. And they built a house and built a sawmill. And uh, he was a man of means. There was a time, he said, during the 30s that the only man around them that employed anybody was his dad, Bert F. Alexander, Sr. And he said they'd have 12, 14 men working at saw sawmill and, and people that would have starved to death if they'd not had that 50 cents or a dollar a day that they made back in those days. So we were from humble beginnings. My dad went on and uh, he said in, in the late 40s came along, he went on to, to war, went, and I've got a few of the letters that my dad wrote from the South Pacific to my aunt, Neva, that was also that day. And uh, after he fought in World War II, he was on four assault waves in the South Pacific. And uh, as he said, didn't get a briar scratch and came home. And he had Vicky and Pat and Butch. And after he got home, they had Linda Kay, who lived three weeks. And then they had Grady. And then my sister Wanda. And in time, some years later, they had me in 1959. So my mom will also be 98. Her birthday will be this week on the 18th. And so it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's just a special week for me with my dad turning 100. So I said, well, he would have turned 100. No, he turned 100. He's just in heaven. And uh, so uh, I'm proud of the heritage that I came from. It's uh, it was a hard work heritage. I'll tell you one last story. My dad told me that he said uh, he went to work for General Motors and they were working for very, very cheap labor. He said, but dad, dad said that he wanted a factory job. He said he'd worked in the fields all of his life and didn't want to just bake in the sunshine and try to plow hard dirt the rest of his life. So. Ford Motor Company came calling and said that they had jobs. And uh, he went up on the bridge at Ford Motor Company and every morning if you got your name called, you went in for an interview. If you didn't, you had to come back the next day. So he said every morning at 5.30, he would be on that bridge waiting. He said one morning a man called, he said, Alexander. He said, I walked in, a man sitting behind a, a table. He said, hold your hands out. He said, I held my hands out like this. He said, turn them over, son. He said, he said, he looked at my hands and fell. He said, yeah, you look like you've done a day's work in your day. He said, follow that man right over yonder. He said, they put me to work. He said, I got home and he said, my mom asked me, he said, Bert, did you get a job today? Yes, I'm sure did. They gonna hire you? Yes, ma'am. How many hours? They work eight hours a day, sometimes 10. What do they pay? He said, $1.29 and a half cents an hour. He said, Mama looked at me and said, Son, do they pay that to you every hour? He said, Yes, ma'am. He said, A few minutes later, he looked at her and tears were dripping off her cheek. Her son had made it. <laughs> he later went on and retired from Ford Motor Company and was always a, a Ford man. Loved factories, loved work, loved Ford motion. Prosperity is a godly thing, ladies and gentlemen. He loved prosperity. He loved to see people get a good job. He loved to see people get upward and get mobile and 
in years to come the, after that, as my brothers and sisters all got up and got older and dad was always real, real proud of uh, how that uh, my brother-in-law provided a nice new car for my sister Pat and, uh, and uh, Vicky struggled but managed to get up and get her a new car bought and, and uh, Butch bought a restaurant and got up and got going and Grady got up and got moving and was working at a freight line and became a, a law enforcement officer and uh, Wanda married Johnny and they did fine and, and, and he said all my kids have done better than I did. I'm thankful. Got a thankful heart this morning. I'm full of nostalgia and, and memories today. So let's all return thanks for our rich heritage. <clears throat> Those that struggled before us and went on and gave us a better life and we're still here. And our life is better than, than generations past. Amen. 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 Lord knows I, I've got memories of a lot of, uh, lot of memories. I can still smell the bacon and the biscuits and I can hear the pan crackling in the kitchen. We had a washing machine when I was a kid. We'd have a dryer. Mom would go out on the clothesline and start hanging up clothes. I'd hand them to her and she'd hang them up, pin them. And when the clothes get so heavy, start, the clothes start dragging the ground, she'd take a stick that she found that had a fork at the end of where the limb came out. She'd push it up on that line, lift it up and stand it up. And so the clothes would be up across, the, keep the dogs from jumping up and getting them, getting them dragging the ground. All you, all you young mothers now say, thank God for my clothes dryer. Mm -hmm. Mom did it. I remember her singing and humming and singing and hanging out clothes and happy and blessed. And she said, I said, uh, ma'am, may smell it, fresh outdoor smell. You know, my mom would tell me, she said, uh, son, uh, when I was coming up, we had, uh, old uh, flour sacks and when you once you got done with the flour sack out of the sack you used the the it was a pattern sack and you'd open it up and cut it open and make a pattern out of it and he, she said we made dresses out of flour sacks and meal sacks and things like that who in here can tell me life is better <clears throat> than it used to be <clears throat> <clears throat> yes <clears throat> yes sir we live in America land of opportunity, home of the brave and of the free. In order to bring forth a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal, yes. men began to find a place where they could love God and worship Him. And because they loved Him, they landed on these shores. They had no idea what we would become. If they were to see it now, it'd be beyond anything they ever imagined. God has shed His grace on America. And so as for us, the Alexander name moves on. It was a, a bird Alexander by another bird Alexander who was given birth to by a Nathan Alexander who was given birth to by a Joseph Alexander by a John Alexander, by another Joseph Alexander, all the way back to an Oliver Alexander that came over in 1750 from Innsbruck, Ireland, Micklevaney County, a 20 year old kid, because there was just nothing to be had in Ireland. Landed, best we know in the shores, over near Maryland and came down to Virginia and then dropped down to South Georgia where it was warm. And that's where the Alexanders were for nearly 200 years. So I'm thankful. Just thankful. You know, having a Mother's Day or a Father's Day coming up this month, <clears throat> I'm making, um, <clears throat> I'm just remembering. And uh, the United States of America is the only country Unlike Israel, God created Israel and put Israel together because He loved Israel. 
But America was founded because men loved him. Make no mistake about it. He'll protect our nation. It's when we need him the most that he'll rise, uh, raise up a man like he did with Roosevelt. When we needed him the most, he'll raise up a man like he did with Reagan. When we need him the most, when the nation was about to tip over into what is the default setting called socialism, he raises up another man. Whether you agree with him or you don't like him, he's still the man God put in office. His name is Trump. And it's he that we will pray for every day. There was not a day that I did not pray for Barack Obama. There was not a day I didn't pray for George Bush. There was not a day I did not pray for Bill Clinton. There was not a day I did not pray for George Bush. There was not a day that I did not pray for Ronald Reagan, the first president I ever voted for. So let's all lift our hands. Let's just thank God for the president that we do have. And if he's not doing what you like, then he needs your prayers more than before you decided he's not doing right. Well, Lord, thank you to visit, visit him in the Oval Office, sir. Visit him right there. I'm asking you to fill the Oval Office full of a sweet presence of your spirit that puts his heart in his throat and gives him an absolute fear of judgment of making wrong decisions and give him the ability to wait and think and wait and think and pray until he is sure of his decisions. And then I'm asking you to put people all around our president that will do your will. And if those are unwilling, remove them and replace them with those who are willing to do your will. Keep his family healthy. Keep him safe. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right. Mr. Alexander. Well, good morning, Church on the Word. It's good to see everybody this morning. Uh, can't really start anything without first talking about last week, all the work, all the effort. Aren't you glad it was last week and not this week with the weather? Amen. Uh, but to every single person, there's no way we could name every person that helped. We'd have to just go down the line and thank each individual person that's here to pull off what, what we did last week. But um, to anyone that helped, if you came, if you brought somebody, if you came for the first time last week and you came back, whatever the scenario is, um, thank you so much for your help. I think it went off very, very well. And uh, why don't you just give yourselves a hand real quick. And yes, we still have the balloons up. We're still celebrating, in case you didn't know. I mean, why not, right? 25 years, that's something to celebrate. So, uh, but no, really, thanks to every single person. Um, they aren't even here this morning, I don't think, but I think a big shout out goes to uh, Josh and Anna Henderson, all the work they went in. And I mean, he was still out running around, returning cornhole boards and all kinds of stuff after we were well done with everything, because I know because he came and brought mine to my house. So um, big thanks to them. Big thanks to everyone with the food for the weekday meetings and pulling that off. Big thanks to Drew Alexander for being here to run sound and record sound for so many of those services. It's just a bunch of work. Yeah, all the commercials, everyone who recorded a commercial, um, just, a, again, it's just something, um, it, you know, and, and what's, what we've learned about church is when you do something like that, that's not when the work's over, that's when it starts, right? <laughs> Because now we have people to follow up with and people say, hey, you know, we've we got to go back and look, what can we do better and all that kind of stuff. So um, don't think you're out of the woods yet. We can, we can still use some more help. But, uh, but no, really, thanks to everybody for last week. Uh, this Wednesday, we're back to our regular schedule. Uh, our free supper begins at 6 o'clock and we have our adult Bible study and Kids on the Word at 7. Um, our new playground is here. We've had a ton of people ask about the playground. I think the concern was we might not have it put together for the celebration service last week. Um, that was never the plan. <laughs> that wasn't on the agenda with everything we had going on, but we do need to get the playground assembled. If that's something you can help with or would like to help with, please let Lynn Lewis know up here on the front. And uh, we're going to figure out a time to, because it's probably going to take more than one person or more than two or maybe more than three or four or five. So. Yeah, a whole bunch of work and effort. But hey, it will serve the children here at Church on the Word for years to come. So it'll be worth the effort. But we're going to put all that together, hopefully um, get a game plan on that this week. Every time William sees me, he wants a playground update. 
<laughs> as soon as we got here in the rain, they were like running outside in the rain to check and see if the playground was put together. So it would be a personal service to me for my son if you will go. Um, help us put that playground together. Um, Sunday, May 26, we're having a baptism service here. Uh, please call the church, leave a message, let Pastor John or Janie know if you would like to be baptized. Uh, when uh, They'll give you instructions then, but we want you to bring a dark change of clothes and a towel. And again, we'll get into more details as we get closer, but that is uh, May 26, right around the corner, actually. Our adult uh, Sunday school class is every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. Uh, Miss Gay Burge teaches that class, and Wardwise Bible College is on their summer break. So that'll start back up in probably September, right? So. Banquet and a movie night, graduation. So, well, so just be on the, yeah, be on the lookout for that. We'll have announcements about that, but that is on summer break. We'll hand out certificates next Sunday. Is that correct? We're not sure. Okay. okay. Sunday week. And uh, Lance, do we have that video ready to roll this morning? We do have a special announcement this morning, but we'll start with the video. working part-time as a pharmacy tech and doing my CNA studies and then I found out I was pregnant and I was just stuck. <laughs> stuck, didn't know what to do, didn't know what to expect, how I would make it work and I was just looking for answers pretty much. The sound I felt a smidge overwhelmed, um, but once I saw the little baby, little tiny pea there, it just gave me a sense that everything was going to be okay. I decided to keep Kingston probably at the ultrasound. When I saw that little baby there, I knew that I had to be the one to protect it, so I knew there was no way I could go with any other option besides being a mother to him or her. <laughs> My baby Kingston is just wonderful. He lights up my world um, every morning when I wake up and he's up, he just looks at me and smiles and that just gives me everything I need to go throughout the day. Uh, he's a very happy baby. Um, so the PRC Medical Center, their baby bottle fundraiser is starting now. We did this last year, if you remember. Um, what we want to do is we want everyone to get a bottle, right? And we want you to fill it up with your change, dollars. If you want to drop a sack of hundreds in here, they wouldn't mind it. I mean, but um, guys, this ministry, and you've heard me talk about it before, but I think sometimes in Christianity in general, we all can, and you know, obviously we preach grace and mercy from here and we try to avoid judgment. And, and it's real easy to say, right? But it's also real easy to get caught up. And I think right now, politically, we get caught up in this debate. And if you think about it, it really is ridiculous, okay? Um, trying to, you know, you're right, well, this and that, and there's this fight. And no one talks about the actual individuals that are going through the crisis pregnancy. Make sense? In Scripture, remember when Jesus um, spit on the ground and made clay and the guy that had been blind since birth? See, back then, in that time, they thought that when a kid was born blind or maimed or there was some issue, they thought it was because of sin either in the kid's life or in the parent's life. 
they sinned in the womb and that's why he was blind. Or the parents sinned and that sin transferred to the child in the womb and that's why the kid was blind. So they were looked down on. They were ashamed. They, these were not good people in society because the child was born blind. And when Jesus healed him, remember the Pharisees, they were trying to figure out, well, was it because of this kid's sin or was it because of that mom's? And Jesus said, I'm not even talking to you about that. He didn't even address that. Make sense? And, and what Jesus was saying is that this child right here hasn't seen since he was born, but now he can see. And his story was, I once was blind, but now I see. Amen? These people, there's people in our county right now, there's people that you know that would not be here if it were not for this ministry in the county. And it's not because they sit around and argue over what you should or shouldn't do. They actually go out and help these girls that are having trouble trying to figure out what they need to do with this pregnancy. Make sense? That's what the church body should be doing day in and day out. Um, I follow a Facebook group and people were arguing about some tattered old American flag hanging at one of our ballparks and like oh the county can't even keep up with the flags and well you know they're busy they got and they're arguing and then one guy actually went out and just changed the flag and posted a picture hey we changed the flag <laughs> well right just went and solved the problem why can't we go out and solve the problem amen this ministry is a problem solving ministry yeah, exactly. this ministry is they're 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 out there and they you know we, we're not looking at people as statistics we're not saying this many percentage of people get abortions we're not saying this many percentage of the kids that are born into poor households have a higher likelihood of drug addict we're not look we're we're helping this one individual make sense we're giving kingston a shot that he never would have had because of this ministry and you can support that ministry today you can support that ministry this week. So we want, we want to pass out the bottles now. Is that the plan? All right, so anyone that wants a bottle, if you'll please raise your hand. Allison is going to bring you a bottle. Allison is not a child that wouldn't have been here without the ministry. We just want to put that caveat out there. She would have been here anyway. Um, but, uh, but no, y'all, this ministry is just, it's special. We were actually, um, I say we, I was probably, what, six years old or two years old or something like that, but we were part of the church that helped birth this ministry in the county, right, Definitely. when it first started. Um, so it was a different name then, wasn't it? It was the Crisis Pregnancy Resource Center. You're right, a little bit different. But, but it's the same exact people, same ministry. And uh, Yeah, I know. We've, that's how we've always been trained to say it. For years you hear the announcements and things like that. Pregnancy Resource Center. Yeah, okay. We're out of bottles. Well, here, we got one right here, so... Yeah, we'll, we'll get more bottles. There'll probably be people that want them next week. That'll be fine. Um, the bottles are due back on Father's Day, so we run Mother's Day to Father's Day. That's probably, what, June 14th, 13th, somewhere around there? So, okay, June 20th, something like that. Okay. But, so, very good. So, now that we know what ministry we're supporting here for a little while, who's ready to honor the Father with giving this morning? Amen. If you need a cash envelope, please raise your hand. These gentlemen are coming forward. This gentleman is coming forward, and he can serve you. Just keep it up high till you get a cash envelope. So, we can have a record and give you a receipt of your giving.
Okay, and this morning, just like we said with the uh, Pregnancy Resource Center, you know, when we give to them, you have to look at it as an investment, right? You're investing into somebody's story. You're literally changing somebody's life by giving to that ministry. And that's true when you give to the kingdom in general, right? We believe that's what's taking place when you give to this ministry. So this morning, we're going, when we receive this offering, we're going to, you know, pray over the offering. We're going to pray that for financial wisdom like we normally do. But we're going to pray for the individuals that we'll be able to impact and affect as a result of this morning's offering. Amen? Let's lift our hands. Father, we thank you for blessing us so that we can be a blessing. We thank you for giving us so that we can give and invest and see your kingdom grow. And right now, Father, we pray for each individual that needs to learn the basic tenets that we teach from this pulpit, the righteousness, redemption, healing, prosperity. We thank you, Father, in advance for the harvest that will come as a result of this offering. Not just the harvest of, of receiving financial blessings, but the harvest of individual peoples growing and understanding, people walking out more productive in their Christian life, people, people having better days, people having relationships mended, people we just speak the end from the beginning and we thank you for blessing us with souls that are improved as a result of today's offering. We thank you for this ministry. We thank you for everything that you've blessed us with, sir. And we pray that you show us how to be good stewards over everything we have and how to increase our dominion here in the earth. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Gentlemen, you can serve the people. Kids on the Word and junior youth can be dismissed at this time. That takes us kindergarten through what? Eighth grade? Ninth grade? Twelfth grade? So we're, not, we're not calling them junior youth anymore. They're not, it's just the youth. That's what happens when the youth, the junior youth get older. They become youth or senior youth. I was asking Andrea this morning if she would still love me when I got older. She said, I think you're already there. I was like, <laughs> so I haven't left yet. Aren't we older? Yeah, that's, that's exactly how I took it. That's exactly what I heard. I haven't left yet. I was like, okay, great, great. So what happens when you have a kid going to high school next year? Hard to believe. Two. Yeah, Melissa and Ray just walked out. I don't know where they are. All right. Got a scripture for that. If I can find it real quick. Is that all right? Yeah. It made me think about the letter. Did y'all know that Jesus wants to comfort mothers yes. that are in distress? Yes. I think it's in John. Yep. You talk about a mom in distress. Um, when Jesus was being crucified, you know, it was an open punishment and people saw what was taking place. That was part of it. And we know from scripture that his mom was there watching that take place. Can you imagine what that would be like? Can you imagine the emotions and the, the stress? And, and to make it even more gut-wrenching but you know y'all you know people go through gut-wrenching gut stuff every single day right we we know that um and the scripture speaks to that this isn't just something that we play and do and we're happy and we lay 
raise our hands, but it doesn't really apply to real life. It applies past the worst thing you've ever heard. Makes sense. And in this scripture, as best we can tell people that you know really study this probably as well as we all should, we think that Jesus is you know, not his real dad, but you get the idea of the dad that raised him, Joseph, we're pretty sure he passed away somewhere between Jesus' first and second year of ministry on the earth. So that means that Mary was left without her husband, and Jesus had kind of taken that role of being the, the you know, the support system for the family, taking that, that head, the head of the family. And when Jesus is on the cross, um, here in John chapter 19, verse 25, it says, Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. So you've got these three women watching Jesus die on the cross. And when Jesus therefore saw his mom and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he said unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. And then he said to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. So Jesus knew that he was leaving, and he knew his, that Joseph, her husband, was already gone. And from the cross, in the middle of all that, he sees his mom, and he goes ahead and arranges and saying, this my number one man right here, my main disciple, John, is writing this, saying, this is your son. And John said, this is your mom. He reestablished who was going to calm her, who was going to be the shoulder she could cry on, who could be there for her regardless of what she was going through. And she had to be in the worst throes of agony a mom could ever be in. Yeah. Make sense? Yeah. So if Jesus is able to provide that calming effect and that support for his mom, he's no respecter of persons and he can provide it for you hmm. no matter what you're going through. Amen. Mm -hmm. So just know on this Mother's Day, yes, it's celebration. And some people, it's tough because we know you've lost moms or you've lost um, things. And there, there may be relationships that need to be mended. Just put your trust in Him. Amen. <laughs> Amen. He, he will find a way. He will find someone. I, John had no idea what was going to happen that day. He didn't know he was gaining a mom when all that was taking place. And scripture doesn't record it, but I'm confident that he was a phenomenal son to her until the day she passed away. Amen. Amen. And um, I mean, I mean, think about after Jesus died, right? They were probably trying to find the body and did he really raise from the dead? And they're walking around killing his followers. And she gave birth to this, you know, what would have been at the time, you know, most wanted, right? Fugitive list, you know, this terrible person. And, and he was there to guide her through that, hold her, you know, listen to her stories, be there to catch her tears, be there to support her on the good days. And um, that's, that's the Savior we serve this morning. Amen? Amen. So, so whatever you're going through, just know that Jesus has it and, and His heart is towards you. His heart is towards mothers. And I think it's a special day where we can know that aspect of the story as well. Amen? Well, we can go home now. That's a good message. That's a great message. My goodness. Should have just let him preach. John. Yes, sir. He doesn't know it yet, but he's like a wonderful pastor. Yep. I agree. This front row is completely empty. Why have we abandoned the front row? Why don't we take that front row away and then y'all be on the front row? <laughs> face y'all. Everybody comfortable? One fan and one covering up. Let's all lift our hands for just a minute and thank you. Larry brought his mama. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, sir. Just a few more days in the earth. We'll go on to greater things. We're not done yet. For just a few more days, we'll go on to greater things. But right now, we're not done yet. We got things to do. We've got people to see. We've got people that have 
needs. We have people that have need to have hands laid on them. We have people yet that have need to be blessed in the earth. And here's where our power is, is in the earth. Amen. Amen. I hear it twice now. Fear not, little flock. It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Everything you need. I'll start with this one. Here, young mama, you got four boys that you have raised. I think that deserves a rose. I'll let you have that through the service, and I'll hand these others out at the end of the service. Take a Bible. Turn to the fifth chapter of the book of Mark. I'll show you something and we'll be dismissed. This message is uh, adult content. It might not be suitable for some children. So if you're a child and you think this might would be uh, overly for your sensitive heart, then um, we have a children's church <laughs> available for you. This is adult content but it's where adults live. Mark, fifth chapter. <clears throat> I usually, if, you've know, if you know me, you know I, don't, I may say the same stories over and over, but I usually don't preach the same messages over and over, do I? Am I? Not much. But I've been revisiting some of my older messages, looking at them and wondered if I ever knew that stuff, because it was good at the, for the time then present. And uh, so we revisited some of those things. Of course, when you go through a 25-year celebration and look back, I've looked back on what he was teaching us and what the theme of the Holy Ghost was for that first 25 years as he's moved and uh, moved among us. And so uh, that's why I brought some of the same messages that I had preached in the past during that 25-year celebration. Today, I've, I've revisited another one that I had taught and... Uh, and I want to talk about it again because it is just so where we live. How often do you see people live realities that we don't talk about much in church? Let me say it again. How often do you see us live realities that we don't talk about much in church? Very often. Mark chapter 5. Father, thank you for the written word. Stretch your hands. Ask the Lord to use me this morning. Ask him for strength to, to speak by his spirit to you so that you can hear by this what he has to say, not what I say. Lord, I've received the prayers of my brothers and sisters. I ask you to connect our hearts, my heart to theirs, my words to their ears, and hear what you have to say in what we speak and say today in Jesus' name. Amen. Fifth chapter of the book of Mark, beginning in the 24th. First verse, I believe it is. Mark chapter 5, verse 21. When Jesus was passed over again by ship unto the other side, much people gathered unto him. And he was nigh unto the sea. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet. And besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come, lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. Jesus went with him. Everybody say, Jesus went with him. Jesus went with him. And much people followed him and thronged him. And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood twelve years and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway, <laughs> I like that, Straightway, the fountain of her blood was dried up, 
And she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the multitude thronging you, and sayest thou, Who touched me? <clears throat> and he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. And while he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, Thy daughter's dead. Why trouble thou the master any more? Any further, as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. And he suffered no man to follow him, save Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And he cometh to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and seeth the tumult, and them that wept and wailed greatly. And when he was come in, he said unto them, Why make ye this ado and weep? The damsel's not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. But when he put them all out, he takes the father and the mother of the damsel and them that were with him and entered in where the damsel was lying. And he took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, Talitha kumai, which is being interpreted, Damsel, I say unto thee, Arise. And straightway the damsel arose and walked for she was of the age of 12 years. And they were astonished with a great astonishment. And he charged them straightly that no man should know it and commanded that something should be given her to eat. Who in here can tell me you've read this story before? Has this story fascinated you? In every instance where there is Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue, there is also interwoven into this narrative the woman with the issue of blood. She's in every story. There are three places where the gospel is recorded. I think it's in Matthew 9, I believe it is. It's also in Mark 5, and I think it's in uh, Luke chapter 8. <clears throat> I've had questions about this story from day one. Questions I've had concerning this story are this. Verse 23. Little daughter? She's 12 years old. It's not like it's a four-year-old, a three-year-old toddler. He said, this is my little daughter. What do you know about girls that once they get in about 10, 12, 11, 12 years old, what do they start doing? And they start growing faster than the boys, don't they? Typically, a 12-year-old girl is about almost at the size she's going to be in her adult years. So why is she called a little daughter at 12 years old? That was a question I had. And my, here's another question. Why is this woman interwoven into the entire narrative of Jairus every time? And I've read over the years and wondered, is it because uh, she, uh, Jairus had to have such a wonderful miracle that he needed to have this healing take place on the way to go heal? See, Jesus is going to raise the little girl from the dead to lay hands on her to keep her from dying. And he heals this woman with the issue of blood on the way to Jairus' house. And I thought for years of maybe Jairus needed that example so it would bolster his faith to go on and take him to the place that he needed to have his daughter healed. I've thought that for years. But why is she always in every narrative? Verse 26, it said she suffered many things of many physicians and was none better but rather grew worse. What things did she suffer? I always question it. There was left a question in my mind. And it said she had an issue of blood. How long? Why did every narrative, every time you read the story, why was it significant? Why did we need to know that the woman had had an issue of blood 12 years? Why didn't at least one of the accounts of one of the Gospels say she had been, uh, had an issue of blood for many years or for a long time or but each time it says 12 years. Why? That's, there's no, 
God doesn't just say things to be saying them. There is a specific reason for why he puts things in Scripture so specifically. Why did that 12 years? Why was that so significant? Verse 27 said she'd heard of Jesus. I question, how did she hear of Jesus? If she was sick and at home and unable to move or do anything hardly, why was she, how did she manage to hear about Jesus? They didn't have TVs back then. They didn't have communication devices. Instagram. Verse 33, after she was healed, it says she fell down before him and she told him all the truth. That leaves me with questions. What was all the truth? What was the details of her discussion with Jesus after she fell at his feet? What was all the truth? Verse 37, I always wondered, why did, why did he take in those three disciples? Why did he take in Peter, James, and John, the brother of James? Well, Peter, James, John. Why those three? Several times he did that. Why did the other nine get left outside? Verse 40. What does verse 40 say? And they laughed him to scorn, but when he put them all out, he takes the father and the mother of the, of the damsel. We know who the father is, don't we? What's the father's name? Jairus. Jairus. Well, obviously her mother was at home. He said took the father and the mother of the damsel. That's the first thing I'd surface read it and think that's probably what happened. And then that were with him and entered in where the damsel was lying. Who was the mother of the damsel? Verse 42, when it said that she walked, could it be that she had never walked before? It's possible. Verse 43, here's the, uh, the last question that I had. He said he commanded that no man should know it. You know, there were several times that Jesus did things and he told them, don't tell anybody about this. I would, do you get a hangnail healed today? And they advertise it on Charisma Magazine, and you're on TBN giving the interview. Why are we told not to let anybody know? No man should know what? I think I've got some answers to these questions I want to share with you. Y'all ready for some answers? First of all, you have to understand that with a woman that had an issue of blood under the Old Covenant, she was considered unclean. She was as much leprous as a man that had leprosy. And lepers had to cry out in that day, leprous, leprous. And people would get, and they, they, they had to be uh, confined to a several house and they had to be at a distance. And a woman with the issue, an issue of blood was told to be separated. She was an outcast. Jay mentioned it, how that um, uh, people were considered outcasts that had these, these issues and these problems. A child born blind must have had parents that had sinned. In fact, that was the question in John 9. Who sinned, this man or his parents? And so there was, there was a, a big social ill that's in, in stigma tied to this, this woman with the issue of blood. And um, with that said, verse, let's go back to verse 23. He said, my little daughter, what is the deal? Why is she little at 12 years old? She was underdeveloped. This girl was born premature. Verse 25, ladies and gentlemen, let me read back over the story again with you here and look at something. My sister Vicki told me that in school, in high school in the 50s, if you smoked a cigarette, you were the scum of the earth. And if a girl got pregnant, you were unfixable, irreparable, and you had that stigma on you for the rest of your life, and you were outcast. And all the parents of the children in the school let you know, the children know, to stay away from her. She got pregnant out of wedlock. She got pregnant unmarried. It was always her fault. Nobody really got on to him. I guess these girls got pregnant, you know, by themselves. But verse 25, let's look at that again. I'll show you this. 
A certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years. Let me remind you, how old is the little damsel? 12 years old. The little girl, damsel is 12 years old, and this woman with the issue of blood is not identified as the child's mother. But I'm revealing to you, ladies and gentlemen, this was the mother of the damsel. You listening to me? The reason why God put this in here three different times in the Bible, talked about the woman with the issue of blood, 12 years, talked about the damsel, the little girl born who's 12 years old, is because he is saying the truth without just airing the dirty laundry. Isn't it wonderful how God can get the information over to you? and not? He didn't say, oh, but here came her mother. No, he, he didn't say these things. He just said this woman with the issue of blood, 12 years here. And then let's go to... Let's go to uh, he said she had suffered many things of many physicians and spent all she had and was nothing better, but rather grew worse. When she heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. Here's the other answers that I believe that will do you good. Verse 26, I believe she dealt with blackmail. I believe she dealt with threats of exposure. She had bled since the child was born. And she was dealt with negatively, and I believe that back, back then, not, not only the physical physicians were not just the doctors of physical bodies, they were also doctors of the law. The doctor of the law of Moses also was known to be the doctor of physician, physician care. And so she dealt with having to be the, peop, the few that knew what really happened to her. She was kept, she probably had had some financial well-to-do position in her life at one time because she spent all that she had. There was a time that she had had something to spend. And so she was exploited for financial gain and then blackmailed. How did she find out about Jesus? J. Iris is the one that informed her. He came in that morning. Here's a young ruler of the synagogue. How long had it been since he'd since the child had been born. Twelve years. I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, J. Iris had an affair with this girl. And what happened? He came in that morning to her house. Can you imagine this girl with dark circles under her eyes, skinny, anemic, bleeding, can't even operate in society. And the daughter's back in the back bedroom. And she's at the point of death. She's now shallow breathing. He came in that morning and he said, Look, I know we've been trying to hide this for 12 years. Yes, I appreciate you've been trying to keep my position as a ruler of the synagogue. And it'd be terrible to let that get out. But my God, we're at a place now where the child's going to die and you're going to bleed to death. What good is it if I save my job then? Listen, let me tell you this. There's this man named Jesus. He's been healing blind eyes and he's been raising people from the dead and he's been sent here. We believe he's most likely going to be the Messiah. John was the one that said that he was the one that he baptized and these things have been happening. And anybody can just get close to him and they'll get their healing. I'm going to go to him and I'm going to fall at his feet and I'm going to just spill the beans. I'm going to tell everything that's been done. I'm going to tell it all. I don't care, but what are they going to do, kill me? What are they going to do, stone you? If that happens, we'll just be dead. Where are we going to be anyway? I'm going to go out there right now. I'm going to go, and I'm going to get him to come back here and put his hands on her, and she'll live. You watch. He touch, all he's got to do is touch her, and she'll live. He took off out the door, took off running. What he didn't realize is she had heard of Jesus from Jairus and it bolstered up a faith in her and she took off right behind him. And Jesus falls at Jairus' feet. Y'all, I'm fixing to tell you something about it. I'm telling you who our Jesus really is. He's not the Jesus of church. He's not the Jesus of religion. My former bishop's dad came to me one day and we were talking about some of these things about how that Jesus is just not what people had preached him to be. He's a man of much more mercy and forgiveness. Mercy teaches real good, but until it comes time to, to express that mercy to somebody we don't like or don't think deserves it, then that mercy doesn't preach real good, does it? 
I was telling Bishop uh, Swilly's dad, Jimmy Swilly, came to me he, after a, a meeting we had. And he motioned me out into the hallway. He said, uh, of course, if you knew Jimmy Swilly in, in the day when he, he had a, this blustering voice, sounded like the voice of God, he would talk like that. He said, uh, he said he was in a church in Columbus where he pastored the largest Assembly of God church in Georgia. He said, I preached a message one day called, Is the Jesus you preach the Jesus of the Bible? He said, and I talked about 20 different points where people preached the type of Jesus that they preached. But in fact, what the Bible said Jesus did the Jesus we preach is the Jesus of judgment and makes everybody straighten up, crack the whip, and fly right. But the Jesus of the Bible did not allow a man to throw a rock at a woman taken in adultery. And he cited several of those uh, cases like that in Scripture. And I'm listening to him. He said, after service, my elders came to me and said, Pastor Swilly, we want to let you know that there, and he named this particular person is in the church that wrote a letter while he was preaching, handed it to us to give it to Pastor Swilly. He said, when I uh, was heard that the gentleman had, my, my elders had the letter, they said, Pastor, we want to let you know that you're, you inflamed this person so much so that this letter was such an excoriating expression of uh, how you uh, have preached incorrectly that we have destroyed the letter, you will never read it and we'll never let you hear any details about it. But we've dealt with the issue and we have told the person that they're not welcome here. He said, I'd never had that happen in church. He said, all it was that I had crossed that person's religion. When he said that to me, I thought there was a time that I dealt with that where I had a person tell me that, because I, I had prayed over a person at an altar when we were at the storefront on Fairburn Road, and there was just a compassion that came out of me over some pretty heavy sin that had been in their life, and, and uh, hugged them and gave them the word and told them what the scripture said, and privately I said, no, don't do that no more, it'll get you hurt. And, uh, but I got a, a letter from a person that told me that that, that person that I had so act, act, you acted like that they were just the immaculate conception, that they were perfect and nothing was wrong with them. And you, don't, you just need to know that there's much about them that you don't know. And their life is, a, they began to tell me a lot of details in the letter, not real fine point detail, but they had lied, they had cheated, they had stolen, a lot of these different things. And you, you, you don't even deserve to be a pastor. You don't even know what these people are. How can we trust you around anyone, especially? And they, and they left and, um, because I had compassion on a sinner. Well, let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. If I'm going to have compassion on a sinner and it causes me to lose people, then let them go. Because I find that Jesus was friendly. With, he, was, he was friends with the publican, friends with the sinners. He had compassion on those that are out. The Bible says God was in Christ reconciling the world unto Himself, not imputing their trespasses to them. Religion wants us to impute trespass to people, to rake them over the coals of their past life. Well, this is a very Selah moment in here this morning because the whole atmosphere is so quiet. Y'all listen to me. It says then that this woman, after Jesus, after she came in the press behind and caught the hem of his garment, and he said, who touched me? They said, you see the multitude thronging you? You're asking who touched you? He said, someone touched my clothes. And it's, what does it say? It said that, that the woman came fearing and trembling, doesn't it say? fell down and told him all the truth. What was the truth that she told him? She said, Master, thine handmaid. And I'm just going to give you an idea. It's not written. You can't, you can't prove that it's not written. Even I can't prove what I'm about to say to you is what she said, but I can about give you the interpretive rule as to what happened. You can't prove that I'm wrong. So let's just guess. Let's just guess. 
master. I was a young damsel myself. And all I ever wanted to do was live for God. All I ever wanted to do was go to church and go to the synagogue and worship God. And I came here. In the first week I heard J. Iris preach, he changed my whole life. And he was beautiful. And I kept finding that I wanted to spend more time with him. He pierced my very soul. His words saved my life. In time, I fell in love with him. And in time, we had a child. And from the time of my pregnancy, I was so scared that I'd, they'd find out and he'd lose his job and, at the synagogue. and They'd stone me and I was worried throughout my whole pregnancy. And finally, I gave birth to a premature child. And I've had this terrible blood flow ever since and I've not been able to get rid of it. And we've been trying to keep this story hidden for 12 years. And this morning, after, the, after our baby had taken a turn for the worse, Jay Iris came to me and said, I don't care about my reputation. I don't care. What good is it if the child dies and you bleed to death? And he told me about you. and said that people that just touched your garment would be healed. And he was coming to get you to bring him, bring you to our daughter. And I couldn't wait any longer. I gathered up what strength I had left and I ran after him. And I worked my way through the crowd because I said, if I just touch his garment, I'll be made whole. And I caught your garment. And that virtue washed into me. I could feel immediately I was better. And now whatever has to happen has to happen. Call it sin. Call it wrong. This is the truth. This is the whole truth. And nothing but the truth. So help me God. You think that's what happened? Do you think chances are that's what happened when she fell down and told him all the truth? He said to her, Woman, your faith has made you whole. Go. Go. <laughs> and be healed of that plague. You mean Jesus would heal somebody that had had a child out of wedlock? You think he would? You think he would, even if, even if their illicit affair led to a terrible birth and a, and a terrible disease, even if the sin did cause the sickness, do you think he would just fix it before he made them say the four spiritual laws? and admit that you're a sinner, and get on the public square, and cry aloud to everybody, and hear ye, hear ye, I have sinned. I deserve to be stoned. You think he would heal you before you did all that? You mean he would actually be merciful before you ever even showed that maybe you're willing to admit your wrongdoing? See, that's the Jesus of religion that we hear preached. But the Jesus of the Bible saw a person that had faith and fell at his feet saying, whatever it is I've done, my daughter is lying, little daughter is lying at home almost ready to die. But if, if you come and lay your hands on her, she'll live. And he got up and went with her. And on the way, the child's mother came and he, and she, he didn't even minister to her. She just caught his garment because she had... Say it. She said, say it. She said, she said, she said with her mouth, if I just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be whole. And just by saying it, and she'd heard her Jairus, that a man that she still trusts every word that comes out of his mouth, no matter how their life has turned out, no matter how illicit it was, no matter how wrong it was, she still loves the man and, and believed what he said about Jesus and she caught the man's garment and that washed through her and made her whole of that plague. That's the Jesus that we know, ladies and gentlemen. That's the one I can serve. She lost her self-respect. This man will not talk to me. I'm dirt. I'm not going to be told I'm dirt. I can, I can touch his garment. 
That's how good he was. <laughs> they had to know I had a girl come to me recently uh, from Tennessee to tell me that she was pregnant. She said, but I don't want you to tell um, somebody who's in authority over her. I said, well, I don't have to tell them, but why are you telling me? She says, because I knew you wouldn't judge me. God Almighty, if, if in my ministry, in the life that I'm in the earth ministry, if that is my, if that's my reputation, then so be it. I don't care for another reputation. Let my reputation always be that people would come to me and say, I knew you wouldn't judge me. My God, I can't think of anything any better. I can't think of anything I'd rather hear from anybody other than just to say to me, I knew you wouldn't judge me. No, I won't. Why should I judge you? I didn't die for your sins. I didn't raise from the dead for your justification. I have not ascended to the right hand of the Father. And so until I do, I'm not going to judge you. Well, here's what I have to say today, and then we'll close up. He said he took the, the mother and the father of the damsel and went in with Peter, James, and John, and the rest of them were all put out. Do you know why everybody was all put out? Because they're all waiting to qualify whether or not this that he's about to do should take place. Even nine of 12 disciples had a little problem with it. Simon, the zealot, was very zealous of the law. So they all get out. When we can get, all get to where we trust that it just may be that the mercy of God and the anointing of God will flow regardless, then we'll be promoted to the inner court where we can see the miracles take place. That's the reason we don't see miracles like we need to because we think those miracles have to be qualified for according to our religion. Now, let me remind us all, Jesus came to the earth to save sinners. Amen. She just told him the story of the affair. Verse 43. Jesus is the love that covers the multitude of sin. It's quarter to twelve. I'm going to offer you another little narrative that maybe may or may not be true. But I love to imagine because as I get older, I'm realizing that heaven's pretty close. Now is my salvation nearer than when I first believed. <laughs> hey, I got kinfolk, more kinfolk in heaven than I ever had. And uh, I, I, more and more I have people that I talk to in the earth that are now in heaven. When I was first born, everybody I knew was in the earth. Now a lot of people I know are in heaven. They keep moving, they keep moving on. And so it, it kind of, whether I believe it or not, it is dawning on me that, you know, I may join them one day. <laughs> Chances are. So with that said, I'm thinking that there, don't you think that there's going to be a great party once you, once you get there? Don't you know there's kin folks and relatives going to meet you at the gate? There's a person I know that went into a, 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 a vision, a very clear open eye vision, at the time that Oral Roberts had died. He said he was on a big ship, and he said that it was a cutter that was moving along at a fast pace and slamming onto the, the ocean. He said, I was out near the bow, and he says, a bunch of us were on this boat. And he said, we were, it was crashing and cutting the, the waves. And he said, we kept moving until we came up to a shoreline. He said, and found a place to port. And the sound, the boat's horn went off like that, and they came to the stop and saw that shoreline. He's beautiful, beyond description. A rainbow behind it. Just be, you could not even describe how beautiful. He said, there was a crowd of people out there waiting. He said, we were issued, allowed off a boat. He said, we were directed off of the boat onto the shoreline. He said, and I looked. He was on boat with Oral Roberts. He said, and he looked, and people all began to get out of the way. And Oral walked up onto the shoreline, and here came Evelyn to meet him. And she had a big uh, gift in her hand. And they embraced each other. She was holding, he said, I was watching her hold the gift in one hand and him with the other. 
He said, and then handed him the gift, and he unwrapped it, and when he unwrapped it, it was a guitar. And he said to her, we lost this years ago. He said, she said, no, the angels brought it here years ago for today. And he played her a song and sang to her right there on the beach. Do you believe this is possible? Am I talking so over your head that you think there's no possible way this would, could happen? No, he played and sang to her and played and sang to her. And they embraced, he said, and they went off together. He said, when the vision began to go away. He said, I realized, I, he said, I thought I was somewhere that I, I was actually at. He said, after it was over, he said, I didn't question why I was there at all. But after he got back into his body, he said, I realized this was a, an open vision that he'd seen. I believe that the day will come when we'll have, there'll be tours in heaven just like there are tours here. You can go, you can go to Callaway Gardens for a tour, can't you? Get on a little open top car that, and that drives and you got somebody with a, that narrates and has got a microphone and tells you about everything and, and you just go see all the beautiful flowers and all the settings there in Callaway Gardens. I believe we're going to see things just like that in heaven. I think there'll be a big open top bus and a bunch of people. And we'll be told, sent down the house, down the road where all the prophets live and see the houses of the prophets. Then go by the, the, uh, one of the sides of the gates where you see the names of the people that are written on the, on the stones of the foundation of, of that great city, city wall. I believe that one day you're going to pull up at this, um, on one of these tours, and there, you're going to stop in front of this beautiful mansion. And there's going to be a chariot sitting out front that bears a striking resemblance to a Corvette. There's going to be a man standing out beside it. And the narrator's going to say, do you see this gentleman that's waving to you from his driveway? Wave to him. You're looking at J. Iris, the ruler of the synagogue. And about the time you see him and he's waving at you, you'll hear the door open. And down the steps of the beautiful mansion comes running this cute little thing in a dress with cute little high heels on, and she's going to run and embrace him and say, do y'all see her? And she's waving at us too now. So who is that? That's the woman that was known as the woman with the issue of blood that Jesus healed. Remember that it says that if you were to write down everything, this, the narrator's still talking to us. If he wrote down everything that he did, the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Well, there's one thing that he did that you never heard written. After his resurrection, he performed a wedding ceremony for the two of them. Oh, and next door, their daughter, she lives in the mansion next door. She's married to the rich young ruler. <laughs> Somebody said, well, pastor, that don't hold weight. Because uh, they don't marry nor are given in marriage in heaven. No, they don't, but they marry here, don't they? Well, you, what do you think? You're going to lose your family because you go to heaven? Thank you for joining us today for the Word Wise Christian Broadcast. Remember, God sent us His written word to get our thinking straightened out. When His mindset becomes our own, peace is always the result and victory is assured. Our believing gets straightened out. Our confession gets straightened out. Our life gets straightened out because we have just become... Word-wise, God bless you. See you next week. <laughs>